Congratulations, CCF Singapore. This is your 14th year anniversary. I praise God for your faithfulness and your compassion for the people around you. In fact, your leaders have asked me, can we encourage the CCF from Singapore to be the kind of church that God wants us to become? I already praise God for your faithfulness, but I believe God wants all of us to even grow even more in the area of compassion. Why? Because I discover you and I can be doing the right thing, but the heart is not there. And that's exactly what Jesus wants his disciples to learn. Not just to serve him, but to have compassion. You will notice in the book of Revelation, God was telling his people, you are active, you have deeds, but something is missing. You also discover in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is saying, you are doing the right thing, but no love. I want to expand all of this. And the model that you will learn is about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, our main text for today, grow in your compassion. Three important principles to grow in your compassion from Jesus. The first one, perspective. Learn to see people from God's perspective. Learn to see people from the eyes of the Lord. When God sees people, He does not just see the external. He sees the need. Learn to see people. The second P, learn to see the potential of the harvest that God is preparing for us. The third P, you've got to pray. Compassion will involve prayer. Let's begin. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 to 38. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed, dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. In these few verses, I want to share with you some principles that will help you accomplish God's purpose for your life. The most important principle is this. He felt compassion. In other words, compassion is very important when it comes to serving God, accomplishing His purpose for our lives. The word compassion was not used in the classical Greek literature. It was made popular by God's people describing Jesus. He felt compassion. The word compassion originally was a noun. It became a verb. What is compassion? Let me give you a story, an illustration of what is biblical compassion. I'm reminded of somebody sharing this story of a man who fell into a ditch. He fell into a pit. The first man came along from the east. He was very religious. He said, you know why you fell into the hole? Karma. Another person came, also a religious person from the east. He said, it's all in the mind. If you stop thinking about it, just imagine you are not in the pit. You're going to be okay. The next one was somebody very emotional. He said, I feel sorry for you. I feel pity for you. And then the Pharisee came. The Pharisee said, you must be in sin. That's why you're in the pit. And finally, Jesus came. He went down 
lifted up the man and got him out of the pit. In other words, compassion is love moved into action. It is not just having a feeling. Because the Greek word for this word compassion comes from the innermost. It's describing the belly. You are so touched within. It's internal. It leads into action. So biblically, compassion is love into action. It's love plus action. It's loving enough to do something about it. Why is this so important? I'm reminded of the book of Revelation. For Jesus wants to emphasize the importance of compassion, the importance of love. Notice, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. Do you notice the church in Ephesus is full of deeds? They're not lazy. They're hardworking. Your toil, hardworking, they persevere. In other words, I discover you can be active, you can be serving, you can be full of activities, but no heart. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You can be doctrinally sound, you can believe the right thing, you can be very orthodox. Those are all good. But notice the heart of Jesus. This is from Jesus. He said, You have perseverance and have endurance for my name's sake and have not grown weary. You know what Jesus is saying? You guys are serving me. You are working hard. But what was surprising is this. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What does that mean? You have left your first love. You see, Jesus wants us to serve him out of love. Why you do what you do is very important. While what you do is important, why you do it is even more important. The motive is very crucial when it comes to our service for the Lord. That's why it is so important that you grow in your love for Jesus, in your love for others. Compassion comes when we love the Lord, we experience His love, and when we learn to love others. Do you notice the Apostle Paul said the same thing? In 1 Corinthians 13, if I were to paraphrase 1 Corinthians 13, let me paraphrase it for you. If I have the eloquence of speech, if I can speak very well, but do not have love. It's nothing. If I have the gift of faith, if I have all faith, I can do miraculous things. But do not have love. It's nothing. Notice, if I am so generous, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, my goodness, look at that dedication. But do not have love. It profits me nothing. In other words, what I'm learning is this. What you do for Jesus is important. But he looks at the heart. My prayer is that you grow in your heart for compassion, the love of God, and the love for people. That's compassion. Because God looks at the heart. And how do we see this in action? Let me share this with you. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, seeing the people, he felt compassion. In other words, to develop compassion, you have to see. And to be able to see with the eyes of Jesus, you have to be with people. 
if I don't see the needs, and if I don't see, it's hard for me to have compassion. Notice what Jesus did. His priority, he was going through all the cities and villages. Jesus took the initiative to be with people, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. His first priority is the truth about the kingdom of God, the truth about their spiritual needs. They need to know the truth, the good news, the gospel. But he did not stop there. And healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Compassion deals also with our physical needs. This is so crucial. And I praise God that he's allowing CCF to get involved, not just in proclaiming the truth, but in helping the physical needs of many people today. Because of this COVID-19, we have given over 100,000 food packs. Many of our members are doing something to help in the physical needs of the people. But do you notice something? When our people help, they like to put in the gospel track. They want to put in the truth about Jesus. Because one extreme, you just talk about Jesus, but you don't meet the needs of the people, physical needs. In the other extreme, we focus on physical needs without the truth of the gospel. Recently, God reminded my wife and I to approach our neighbor. I noticed our neighbor was living all alone. She was all alone because her bosses were caught in the COVID-19 crisis. They couldn't come back to the Philippines. They were foreigners, so they were abroad in Europe. They couldn't come back. And I told my wife, I think she needs food. So we approached her. We sent her food. We sent her rice. We sent her fish. You know what she told us? Can I work for you? The power of acts of kindness. And that's what God wants us to do. To show kindness. Not just talk about the gospel. But to live out the gospel. I believe if all of us will learn to share the gospel with compassion. Like what Jesus did. He not only proclaimed the gospel. He also cared for the physical needs of the people. So the Bible tells us, seeing the people, he felt compassion. In other words, to develop compassion, you must be able to see as God sees. When you see the crowds, when you see people, what enters your heart? Do you find them to be a bother? Do you find them to be a problem? Do you want to get away from them? I need to grow in the area of compassion. Many times, I find people to be messy. I like to avoid them. But you know what God is telling me? Ministry is all about people. And people are messy. People are problematic. Notice, he saw them. Jesus felt compassion for them because, notice, when you learn to see things from God's perspective, they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. The word distress has a very strong root word. It's talking about how people are tortured. When you take away the skin from the flesh, when you flay people, the agony, he sees people in pain. And then, dispirited, the word dispirited comes from you're bowed down, discouraged. You feel helpless and hopeless. The truth is this. As you go around and you see your friends, your family members, or other young people, they may seem to be laughing on the outside. But inside, they can be distressed. They can be discouraged. So compassion is the ability to see things from God's perspective. You see people as God sees them. 
Is that how we see people? With compassion. Put yourself in their shoes. And that to me is something I need to learn. And I pray that as you serve the Lord, you serve Him, not just out of duty. You serve Him. I praise God for many of you. You love the Lord. You are serving Him. But please, serve Him from the heart. Because of love. I always tell our pastors and leaders, you can serve God without love, but you cannot love without serving. You see, serving God is a byproduct of love, but you can technically be so involved in ministry without compassion, without love. Notice how Jesus demonstrated the importance of compassion. When the Pharisees, in the same chapter, the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees were so angry. They were very judgmental. They say, Why is Jesus spending time with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you spending time with sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Notice the heart of Jesus. He tells us, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Many of you are sacrificing for the Lord. Praise God. But don't forget, compassion. Grow in compassion. So compassion, learn to see people from the perspective of God. You cannot develop compassion if you are not with people. If you are not with people, you won't see their needs. Let me give you an example of the importance of being with people and you are able to see their needs. You know, recently, there was a D group who decided to show compassion to a Muslim community. They decided to help them by providing food packs, providing help. You know what the Muslim community said? Why are you doing this to us? We are not Christians. Compassion, seeing the needs, is very powerful. I remember a few weeks ago during this COVID quarantine, somebody shared with her how she was so devastated when she heard what happened to her daughter. She felt so bad. She felt like giving up. She could not sleep. My wife then asked permission, honey, can I go and visit her? Now this was lockdown, but it is within our area. I told my wife, okay, go visit her. You see, compassion is when you see the need and then you move into action. Without seeing, without knowing, it's hard to show compassion. Recently, in many of our D groups, we have people who have died as a result of the COVID-19. Because we are aware of what's happening, there is compassion. So compassion comes when we learn to see things from God's perspective, when we put ourselves in their shoes. And that is something I'm still learning. Now, you may not know this. Two weeks ago, I hurt my shoulder. I forgotten how it feels to be in pain. I was in so much pain. I could hardly move. I told my wife, Honey, pray for me. But God opened my eyes to begin to understand many of our members were having pain. Now when I hear our members having pain because of cancer, my heart goes out. Why? You are able to put yourselves in their shoes. The next important word I want you to understand when it comes to compassion is not just to see from God's perspective, you can say the perspective of God, 
the next P, if you don't mind, I want to help you with this. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Notice, compassion will help you see the reality of the potential for a great harvest. What do we mean by the harvest is plentiful? Notice, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The principle of harvest, when you have compassion, you begin to see what God can do. When the Bible uses the word, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, I want you to see what Jesus saw. He said the harvest is plentiful. What does that mean? Well, look at how that word is used. Jesus said to them, to his disciples in John, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Huh. For Jesus, the priority is to accomplish God's purpose, God's plan, and God's work. Accomplish his work. Now, what is God's work? Do you, do you not say, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are white for harvest. In other words, what Jesus is saying, harvest is time sensitive. When you see the potential of harvest, you have to know, time is also crucial. When it is harvest time and you don't harvest it, what's going to happen to the fruit? It will rot. It will go to waste. So Jesus is telling his disciples, don't say it is not your time. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. They are ready for harvest. Do not say you have four more months to go, then comes the harvest. Many times, lack of compassion will make you procrastinate. You feel, well, it's not your time. But Jesus is telling us the potential is there. I ne I've never forgotten what Dr. Bill Bright taught us. He shared that people are hungry for Jesus. People are interested for Jesus. If only we will open our eyes to see the potential. If only people will understand the truth. He said they will come to Jesus. You see, for us, for some people, the harvest is very difficult. For Jesus, the harvest is plentiful. There is tremendous potential. Notice, harvest is referring to souls. The salvation of the souls. Notice what he said. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal. So that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Do you realize this is a great privilege for us? For Jesus, harvesting is about evangelism. There's tremendous potential. And I praise God for what he has done in your lives. Many of you are living with people. They're hungry. Perhaps they're distressed in the heart. They're ready. Do you see the potential? for a great harvest. And lastly, the last P. The first P is perspective. Learn to see the perspective of God when you see people. The next one is potential. Potential for great harvest. When there is compassion, you learn to see things from God's perspective. You learn to see the potential. And lastly, God wants you to pray. Because compassion and prayer, they go together. The only command found in these few verses is verse 38. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest. This is a command. I command you to pray. Why? Because the Lord of the harvest, the one who is concerned for the harvest, is none other than the Lord. 
It is not your work. It is not my work. It is the Lord's work. He is the Lord. Another observation when you pray. Send out workers into his harvest. Do you know this? The principle of the laborers are few. If you want a great harvest, you need more workers. This is the meaning of potential. The more workers we develop, the more harvest there's going to be. So fellow workers of the kingdom, are you developing workers? You have to be intentional. But the key is prayer. You pray for God to send forth laborers. God is concerned. Notice the one to send the workers, it's the Lord. Besides the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. In this ministry, I always tell our leaders, it is not about CCF. It is the Lord of the harvest. It is Jesus. It is his work. So, I want to remind all of us the importance of prayer. Because prayer changes the hearts of people. Many of you have heard of Martin Luther. How God used him to lead the Reformation. Reformation means to bring people back to the Bible. To bring the Bible to the people. Martin Luther had a partner. The partner told him, Martin Luther, Martin, you keep doing, you keep doing what God wants you to do. Well, I am just going to be here praying for you. But you know what? As he was praying, the Lord gave him a dream. In that dream, he saw a great harvest field. It was Martin Luther harvesting all by himself. And he said, Lord, I realize it is not enough. I just pray. I'm going to go and help him harvest. And here's the problem of prayer. Too extreme. We keep doing the harvest without praying. The other extreme, you just pray. You don't do your part. No. You need to balance. You pray as if everything is dependent on the Lord. And you harvest. You work hard. The power of prayer is seen by the story of this couple. I don't know if you have heard about the guy by the name of Ron Hall and Denver Moore. Let me, just, let me tell you the story of Ron Hall and his wife. Ron Hall was a very successful businessman. He was so successful, his mind was all about materialism. He married a wonderful, godly woman by the name of Debbie. Debbie had a compassion for the poor, for the lost. Well, Debbie kept praying for her husband. One day, the Lord did something. Run home was discovered to have been womanizing. What was shocking was in the midst of pain, the wife chose to forgive Ron Hall. Ron Hall promised he will never do it again. And he began to help the wife. Years later, he began going to this place where the poor will go and the wife will provide food for the poor. It's like a place where the hungry can go. There was a man by the name of they called him Denver. Denver was somebody that you'll be scared of. He was valiant because Denver was mistreated. When Denver was young, he worked for almost 20 years without salary, treated like a slave. He was angry. He was 
punished for helping a white woman fix her tire. So for Denver, white people is something that he really hated. He was put in jail also. Now can you see what happened to Denver? Full of bitterness, full of anger. When he went to this place where they were providing free food, he was angry. He wouldn't talk to anybody. And the wife told her husband, Ron, help that man. Ron was scared to death because the guy was violent. He was throwing a tantrum. To make a long story short, Debbie and Ron began to show compassion. They would go out of their way to, bef to befriend this black man. The name of this black man, he had a nickname. They called him suicide. You know why? If you want to go near him, you will commit suicide. You may be killed. But not this couple. Because of the love of the Lord, they showed compassion. Debbie developed cancer. And before she died, she told her husband. This is what she said. Don't give up on Denver. God is going to bless your friendship. God is going to bless you in a way that you will never know. And that, my friend, is what Ron Holt did when the wife died. He kept on developing friendship with Denver. Today, Denver and Ron have raised millions of dollars for those homeless, for those who don't eat. This is the power of compassion. And God wants to use you. Will you be that person? I want to close with a simple illustration of what my grandchildren did. They did an amazing project. How one small act will have a lot of repercussion, a lot of effects that only eternity will tell what will happen if somebody will show compassion. You will notice in that illustration, one deed, one act has amazing implication. The same thing with you and your ministry. If you will listen to the Lord, the Lord of the harvest, and develop compassion for those people around us, show kindness, show love, you will never know the impact that you and I can do. You will really make a life. You will really make a difference in the lives of people. The power of compassion. God wants us to love people, to take action. There may be some of you who are watching this for the first time. And you must have been surprised at the heart of Jesus. You see, Jesus had compassion for tax collectors, for the prostitutes, for the drunkards. And some of us may feel like, perhaps, I don't deserve the compassion of the Lord. On the contrary, can I tell you, in the story of Matthew chapter 9, you have a contrast between the compassion of religious leaders, the Pharisees, and the compassion of Jesus. And Jesus wants you to know He loves you. Compassion is love in action. And that's what Jesus did. He died on the cross for you. 
And that is the message of CCF. I pray that all of you who are in Singapore, you have known the Lord. I pray that you will redouble your compassion. Grow in compassion so that you will have this burden as you see the needs of people. They may look good on the outside, especially Singaporean. Everybody looks good on the outside, but inside it's empty. Inside, they are under stress. Well, I want you to know, God loves you. And God is saying, if you are tired, you are weary, you come to Jesus. And that's the message that we are to give to the people. We have to show them our compassion. It is not enough to talk about the gospel. People come to Jesus when they see our compassion. I believe God will be the one to have an amazing harvest that will blow our mind because God cares for people and we are his partner. Have you ever thought about why we needed to pray? Because we are God's partner. Why is God asking us to pray for workers? Because it is a privilege to be a partner of God. God could have raised up workers on his own, but he said you pray. So compassion is really the partnership of God and men. We allow the Lord to walk in and through us. And that's why he tells us you pray. Learn to pray for people. Before you talk to Jesus about them, pray for them. And then you pray to the Lord of the harvest. It is really God's work. We are just participants. The pressure is not on our shoulder. We are just servants. We are just co-workers. And I pray you raise up more co-workers. You pray. If you have not experienced the compassion of the Lord, you have not experienced this unconditional love of the Lord, pray with me. I want you to surrender your life to Jesus. I know you are listening to this message, not by accident. Perhaps you have been turned off by Christians in the past. You don't realize the compassion of the Lord. You have been judged. You have been criticized. Because the truth is, many times, Christians are the most unloving people. They claim to be Christians, but they don't live out Christ's likeness. I pray that CCF Singapore will live lives in such a way that people will see Christ in us. And if that's your desire, to experience the love of God, pray with me. Lord Jesus, as I come before you, just as I am, I know I don't deserve your compassion, but thank you for teaching me. Compassion is something that comes from God. It's unconditional. Lord Jesus, I accept your love for me. How much you care for me. I invite you to be my Lord, to be my Savior. I accept your gift of forgiveness. I accept your gift of eternal life. Change my heart and help me to have a heart of compassion to tell others about your love. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.